Welcome to Grand Slam KBO Weekly Walk-Off, our new show where we talk to some of the people who have made the Korean Baseball League such a wonderful experience for fans to enjoy. This is our first interview of the season. I'm Andrew Farrell and I'm here with Brad Dene. Hello, Brad. Hey, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. Are you excited for this new show of ours? I am. Uh, we are braving the time zones and ready to get our first guest on. Yeah, we're going to be talking to my KBO founder, Danny, ne- uh, Danny Kurtz, <laughs> Danny Kurtz, in just a couple of moments' time. Uh, before we get on to that, just a reminder that you can follow us on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Grand Sam KBO, and Brad is on Twitter at... At Desperately Underprepared. Uh, my uh, Twitter name is... Jeez, you would have thought I would have learned this from last time. Uh <laughs> Probably underscore Brad. That's my Twitter. Um, maybe I'll send out my first tweet tonight. Who knows? Oh, okay. Well, there we go. So, at Grant Sam KBO for myself, <laughs> Andrew Farrell, and at probably underscore Brad. I'm delighted to say we're joined now by Danny Kurtz, Korean Baseball's most famous fan and founder of the excellent MyKBO.net website and Facebook group of the same name. Danny was a regular contributor on our original Grand Slam KBO podcast in 2017 and 2018. Danny, thank you so much for joining us again. Well, I am more than honored to be here, gentlemen. So this is our new show, Grand Slam KBO Weekly Walk-Off. The idea of this show is more to talk about people of interesting stories to say about uh, KBO, whether they be fans or journalists, former players, anybody really, just people who have a nice story to tell about how they got into baseball in Korea and what makes it so special for them. So we thought it would be perfect to start this uh, mini-series, I guess, off with yourself because you're seen by many people as Mr. KBO on uh, Facebook and Twitter. You think that's an accurate uh, reflection of who you are? I am more than just KBO, but no, <laughs> I, uh, KBO does play a big part of, of my, my life right now and my hobby, but, um, it wouldn't be without like people prior to me. Like I know a friend of Grand Slam would be Thomas St. John, and he's actually the inspiration of why I got into the KBO because he at the time was the only one writing English articles about the KBO, um, 20 years ago. So without him, I would have never even learned like, the basics about the league because at the time my Korean is very bad. It still is, but without him, I'm not able to learn about, you know, Hey, these are the star players for the, you know, for the upcoming season. Now, um, since he's, you know, retired and gone on to different, different things, I've kind of maybe taken over for him and just tried to provide that same information for other fans, because I know, when somebody moves to Korea, usually the first thing they want to do is uh, find, like, if you're a sports fan, you want to check out what the local sports scene is like. So uh, that was me. And so it's like, whether it's the K League, whether it's the KBL, uh, the basketball league, I've never gone to a professional volleyball game over there. That's one thing that I wanted to do if I ever get back. Um, but the KBO is one of the most, is the most popular league, I'll say. And because of that, um, I always get hit with questions like, hey, what's going on for the for the league? And now... 20 years later after becoming a fan now, I guess you could say that um, I started learning more about the league and am now able to help others learn more about the league that are new to the country or new to the KBL. So I don't know if that really answers your questions, but yes, I, I try to, I try to be able to help out as many people about the league as, as I can. <laughs> um, great. So I get the- might as well start off at the beginning then, because I know you've talked about this in different uh, guys before. We were talking about the your first experiences of Jam Show. We had a, a you had we had you on the show earlier on this year. So in terms of this particular podcast, though, not just not just related to Jam Show, but I guess all of Korean baseball, can you just let 
um, the listeners know what your first experience was of a, a, a game in Korea, anywhere in Korea, really, back about 20 odd years ago. And what was the game day experience like at any ballpark in the KBO back then? Sure. Well, um, it was 20 years ago, so memories are a little rough. Plus, I was I was 20 years old at the time, so it would have been like the fall of the year 2000. My friend said, let's go out to a game. So I said, I'm always up for baseball. We went out to Chomshill. We saw the Deuce on Bears. That's who I remember. And the one player I remember is Tyrone Woods because he was like this, this big foreign massive slugger that obviously stood out on the team. And I re- just remember him hitting a massive home run. I was drunk because <laughs> I was college. Yeah, I wasn't 21 yet. So here in the United States, you got to be 21 to drink. I'm 20 over in Korea. It, you know, it's the drinking age. So I am, I'm in college. I don't remember a lot from that first game. I just remember being blown away by the fans, the singing, uh, Woods hitting a massive home run. And then me coming out of it, just going like, hey, I, I need to go back to another game. And so – Basically, what ended up happening that that season, the fall, I went to like maybe one more game, and then I started going to a lot more the following spring in the year 2001, started going to more games. But um, and I wasn't always sober at those games either, <laughs> but what, what my biggest, my, the biggest thing that I remember is um, the crowds were not as large as they are right now out of games. So... Um, you may be seeing like 10,000, 11,000 people out of games now. But back then, I just remember that's what stood out to me was, wow, these little bit of fans make a lot of noise. So honestly, it's probably still the same now because you go to some certain weekday games during the week at Cham Show and maybe NC or Kiwoom's in town. There's not a lot of fans out there, or at least right away. And so I just remember going out and going, wow, these 3,000, 4,000 fans are really loud in like a massive stadium at Cham Show. And I'm like that's pretty amazing how much sound can be made from so few of fans. So it was kind of like um, striking to me that the crowds have now sort of increased, which is awesome over the last 20 years. But back then, um, especially I remember I went to a game in Suwon when the Hyundai unicorns were playing. The, the Hyundai unicorns were the, like the, the storied franchise. They were the deuce on bears of, of the, of that time, the early two thousands. And I just remember going out to that game in Suwon and going, there's nobody here. I mean, literally, it felt like hundreds of people, if that. And so I just always referred to Suwon as the library because it was so quiet. But it, it blew my mind because they were winning Korean Series championships. And when I went out to them, I was like, man, they got no fan support, like despite being this dominant team. Yep. So it, it, it's just been crazy how to see how over the 20 years, like, like there's more interest in the KBO within Korea. Based on your experiences in baseball in general, where did that actually start for you? Uh, well, I grew up a fan of the Philadelphia Phillies. I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania, so that made me an automatic fan of the Phillies, basically. Uh, the funny part is none of, none of my family members when growing up were like hardcore sports fans. Like they, you know, they maybe said, hey, let's go to a baseball game because my dad got tickets or something or like – or any other sports. And it was always me just running home, grabbing the newspaper back then, grabbing a sports page, reading about it, learning about it, trying to digest as much information as I can, collecting baseball cards. I remember like when I was six, seven years old, got like the 1987 tops series. And I was pumped because a seven year old got baseball cards, but like, Nobody in my family was like excited about sports like I was. And so I just became a Philadelphia Phillies fan. There's no internet back then. So you just rely on the daily sports page. Um, like I said, I lived in Eastern Pennsylvania. I lived in near the town of Reading, which happens to have a minor league baseball team for the Philadelphia Phillies, the Reading Phillies. And that was like my very first probably pro sports game. It was like a minor league baseball game. And just going out there, and because it's a minor league baseball game, you have access to the players more. And so I'm like a like eight years old going down, like, can I have your autograph and stuff like that. So obviously, they're you know even back then they were they were a lot more you know friendly to the little kids. So like I just remember going, and that's like why well, I think players play a huge part in trying to develop fans. Like when you're when you get the little kids out there and they're signing for me, I still remember that. Like I don't even remember who the player is, but I just remember getting my baseball signed by like nine guys. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is amazing. I had no idea who they were. <laughs> um, 
but it just struck me as like, hey, this is why I think fan service in, in KBO is very huge to like kids that are just trying to develop. If you're trying to develop fans, whether it's in Major League Baseball or Korean Baseball, man, you got to give back. So that's, I think Gio had this article with David Buchanan from the Lions just recently. And he talked about like, uh, Buchanan just talked about how like, the fans play a big part in who he's become as a player because he tries to give back to them as much as he can. And when he's like, now it's hard because obviously of the pandemic, but I think that's awesome to see players that do that, especially in the KBO. When I see like, I know OJ one for the Deuce Tom bears gets, gets slammed by every other <laughs> fandom around the league, but yeah. he is one of the most genuine friendliest players off the field to kids and stuff like that um that you know if you're not a Doosan fan you probably don't care but like he's a very popular player but he's you would think that he's not the greatest guy off the field but there's always videos of him just signing for for kids after games and i think that's awesome like he, he i think there's one time in spring training he was just like signing for like an hour just just signing for for kids just kept coming up and he just kept signing for him and like that's great right there because for me as a kid, that's what got me to get interested and stay interested in baseball because there was like, there's interaction. These guys were like, like rock stars to me and they're minor league baseball players, but they took out the time and like signed a little baseball for me. And like, since then that made me want to keep going back to that ballpark. So then how did the actual experience of the games kind of change for you from, from watching a game in Philly to then seeing a game in Chumshill stadium? How did that kind of change your understanding of what baseball is to you? Yeah, well, that was huge to me because um, Philly fans, and even when I was in Reading, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania baseball fans are very tough on their players. There's a lot of booing. Uh, the Phillies were not good at the time when I'm growing up, so there's a lot of <laughs> booing towards whether it's the opposing team, the fans, or even their own team. A lot of booing. So when I get to the KBO, they're cheering all the time. They're cheering for nine innings. They're just always cheering. There's not a lot of booing going on, you know, more or less. Um, even nowadays, there's a little more booing. Um, but it's not even boo usually. It's like ma or something. You know, like when they throw over to first, I was like, ma, you know, don't stop doing that. And so I'm just like, okay, that's cool. In Philly, you just boo. You're like, boo, you suck. I mean, it's pretty not very creative. <laughs> words usually it's usually a bunch of swear words mixed in like you suck um but in the kbo that was the the stark difference is there was not a lot of like jeering of the players um it's more it's always cheering rather than like the negativity i came from <laughs> I came from Philadelphia where it's always known as Negadelphia where everybody's negative towards everything. And it doesn't matter if they're for your team or not. And then here in the KBO, they're like, let's get our thunder sticks. Yay. He might be struggling over 35, but yay. Whereas where I'm from, everybody's like, boo, you suck. Sit down. So like, that's always been the stark difference to me of how positive, which is a great thing. I think for the KBO is how positive fans are, no matter what any, what type of, day it is for the player or like how it is for the you know for the team they're always out there cheering because i mean the hanway eagles what are like the doormat of the kbo for like the last 15 years and they honestly when i mean their fans can be as loud as home fans at away games um because they have such a very passionate following just amazing to me that you can still have that passion despite getting like despite your team sucking for the last 15 years minus like a few odd years where they made the playoffs luckily so i mean it's just amazing because like any other team in North America, they're just like, whatever, man, I'm not giving my money. <laughs> I'm not coming to games. And if I do come to games, I'm just booing you and the team and everybody else. So yes, the positivity that you experience in the ballparks in Korea, I find just strangely frustrating when I started watching uh, the sport. Um, you know, I support the Phillies as well, uh, surprisingly. And as soon as a pitcher has some bad outings, I'm almost in there with them, kind of booing at my iPad. So I remember seeing a game in Chumshul where I think it was actually the Bears versus the Dinos. And the Bears were winning something like 7-1 top of the ninth. But the Dinos fans at an away game were louder than the Bears fans and seemingly happier. And it just confused me to no end at how this could even be the case. Um, how would you kind of take that type of atmosphere? How did, how did that hit you when you got into the sport initially? 
Well, like I said, it was it, it was very jarring and different than what I had grown up with. Even as a little kid, I learned how to boo. Um, <laughs> like I learned to look at the more negative <laughs> parts. So, like when my even when it's my Phillies not doing well, I'm like, why are they leaving this pitcher in? You know, I'm a little or even when I was a teenager, I'm going, you know, like 15. I'm like, what are they doing? You know, this team has no idea. We're not good. You know, why? You know, why are we? Why is he getting paid this? Why? You know, being a typical sports fan or a typical western sports fan i i i guess um then when i jumped to the kbo and like they're just like singing this guy may be hitting like 195 or something zero home runs and he's still playing and you're like why is he still playing and then they're like cheering and they're singing his song and they're like yeah he hit a home run and i'm like dude's not gonna hit a home run the guy's hitting 195 but yet they're still there cheering and singing and i'm like man it, it, it was because it's such a contrast compared to what I had grown up with. I think that's kind of why, it, because it was such a stark contrast, it's what drew me to the start, keep on following the KBO is just because I'm like, that's pretty cool because I'm like, that's pretty amazing that they're still cheering for their team. They're still cheering for these players that are not doing well, you know, or something, or they're losing that game. And they're still there singing their hearts out. And there's no negativity. Nobody's yelling at the players. Nobody's, you know, telling people that they suck. Nobody's saying you don't deserve to be on the team or something. So I'm just like, this is pretty amazing. I mean, North American sports where I grew up is there's a lot of that nowadays. So I, I, I like the opposite feel now with the KBO because there's not a lot of that. Maybe it's getting a little more um, to that. I've not been to a game in the last four years, so maybe in the last four years it's changed. But I'm still going to say pretty much it's still a fairly positive um, atmosphere at a KBO game compared to, say, a not as positive attitude at a you know North American professional sports game or even, I'm sure – you know, like European league soccer. I know when I went to the Irish, uh, <laughs> the Irish professional soccer league in 2006, got to see the Shelbourne, uh, <laughs> Shelbourne play. That, that was um, actually very funny to me because I sat behind probably the most passionate supporter for their team because he was in my ear just screaming um, the entire full 90 minutes just yelling like about the team F off you guys. And I'm like, I don't know anything about what's going on. I have no idea who these players are, but I, my wife and I thought it was hilarious because I'm like, wow, out of all the places to sit, we got in front of the most passionate supporter and he was passionate in positive and negative ways, which is great. But yeah, it, it's just goes to that short, that contrast. Whereas if you're, you know, a new guy going to the KBO games, you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear only the passion for the positive. Pretty much. You're never going to get like, the most negative even like the most drunk guys in the kbo game are usually pretty like positive <laughs> yeah my my brother took his wife to see shelburne play a number of years ago as well and she heard some language at that particular stadium that she'd never heard before at anywhere anywhere else in her life so you'll you'll definitely hear um some colorful language um at football games um in europe that you're probably not going to hear too many other places but how did all of this 20 years ago lead you to set up uh, my KBO. What was the um, like? What was the start that you needed? What what made you feel like you need to set up a website and a Facebook group for people to get involved with? Sure. Well, before the website, it was basically um, message boards, forums, and before that, it was honestly like the Korea Times, the Korea Herald at the time, um, the two newspaper, major English newspaper. Uh, at the time in Korea, they had um, message boards, you know, for like um, a lot of people that lived in there before there was like, there's like Dave's ESL, there's before the Weigukin, whatever, whatever the popular, I don't even know the foreign, foreign, um, yeah. like expat sites in Korea anymore. But before that, it was basically before they even had those sites, you were relying on like the Korea Herald um, message board. And so that's where people just like, it was like classified. They post like, you know, Hey, I have this for sale. Meet me at, you know, exit so-and-so for it or something. Um, and then they'd also be random postings of like, Hey, I want to go to a baseball game or something. And, and I, since I started getting into the league, the ba most basic thing of like finding out where the baseball games are, like what time the baseball games, there's no English language schedule and no English website. There's nothing. So somebody may post like, Hey, who's playing at Chamshell stadium tonight or what's going on at Chamshell stadium. I see that. And, uh, and I'd reply like, there's a baseball game going on. It's between the Deuce Stun bears and LG twins or something. And it starts at six 30 and I'd be like, Oh, okay. Thank you. Or how do I get tickets? You know? Yeah. Um, so I try to quickly explain that. And because of that, that led to me going, Hey, why don't I make my own message board dedicated to that? 
um, just Korean baseball. And so then I just randomly answer on like the Korea Herald would be like, Hey, check out, you know, this message board link. That's how I tried to get more people to join. And then after that became the message board and then it became a website. And then through the website, I was like, well, Facebook is gaining traction. So why don't I make a Facebook group? And so that's how the Facebook group came out to uh, be what it is now, where it's like banter and everything else between that. So, um, that's pretty much how that became to be over the last 20 years or so. But, um, yeah, this this season has been quite the quite the odd season because of how much different it is than it was every other season before that. But it's pretty cool to see new members and see um, their take on the KBO from their point of view, from wherever they may have come from. Yeah, I think I remember the first time I came in contact with you was probably around 10 years ago. And I had written an article for a website in Korea. And I was saying that, look, I'm just one of these foreign baseball fans who has no um, prior knowledge of baseball. I knew nothing about the sport that came to Korea. Um, but I was writing yeah, I was writing an article about this, uh, about baseball in Korea. And you replied in the comment section because I had said that there's nowhere to find any information in English. And you had said that there's a website called mykbo.net. And then from that, I ended up finding your Facebook groups. That was about, that was probably about 10 years ago now. Um, so I was just wondering, like, is that how you got a lot of people to come on board back then? Did you notice that, I guess 10 years ago, a lot of teachers when they're moving over, trying to set up their own blogs, their own mini websites, whatever. Yeah. Did you try and engage with a lot of people who you saw online and try and encourage them to come over to mykbo? Yes, that's basically how it began. Because, like I said, I would like on the on the message boards on the uh, the newspaper sites, I'd say, "Hey, check out this you know message board and be my address." This is before I had my the my KBO uh, domain. Oh, and then once it became the my KBO domain, um, again, like I said, I was already I had taught in Korea before and worked in Korea and lived in Korea. So I was still part of some of those expat communities. And so I try to help them out there. I'd post it, um, post my website, say, Hey, check this out. Because I, I was all about trying to help fans learn more about the, uh, learn more about the league. I still am. Um, and honestly, before this season, I mean, pretty much the only people that ever were interested in the KBO outside of say like, Hey, let's find out what Hyunjin Roo's, you know, former team was like the Hanwha Eagles or something like that. Honestly, the only people that are interested in the KBA were the people that were in Korea, whether that's Korean people themselves or the expats to come over to work and live. Um, those are generally the only people that ever cared about the KBO at that time. And so that's why I just have the website. And whenever I was on those sites or, you know, saw the very few English language articles about that, I'd be like, Hey, you know, check out this site. If you want to learn more, just trying to help others learn more about like, like such as Andrew, like, Hey, he's new to the country. He wanted to know more about the league. I saw that been like, Hey, check out, you know, check out this site. Maybe I can help you out. So since 2000, when you came into the league and then since you started the, my KBO page, how do you think the league has changed? What would you say is one of the biggest changes in the KBO right now in 2020? Uh, well, up, up, up till this, <laughs> up till this season, the biggest change has been, like I mentioned, the, the size of crowds that get out to the games and actually just kind of the whole overall interest in the league itself compared to what it was 20 years ago. So I'm 20 years ago, I'm starting to get into the, get into the league and I'm trying to watch the games. And honestly, I remember being, being able to turn on TV going, what channel is the game on? Nobody cared. Nobody told me. And then all of a sudden you'd be like watching like SBS or something. And all of a sudden, like whatever show was on would end. And then all of a sudden baseball just appears. And then, after nine innings, after the game's over, literally baseball would just disappear and they'd go on to their next drama or a new show. I'm like, well, this is really weird. Now, 20 years later, you have, what, four to five sports channels. You have all five games being broadcasted. All of them have a pregame show. All of them have a postgame show. Um, that interest just – I mean, that just shows me there's interest in that, whereas 20 years ago, nobody cared. Uh, what struck me as funny, too, was back then or even – throughout the years of living in Korea, starting to see more people wear KBO gear even outside of the stadium. So 20 years ago, literally nobody wore KBO gear. And that struck me as weird because coming from America, where I'm from, everybody wears sports gear. I mean, you buy sports gear for anything. I mean, the amount of money people just drop going to a baseball game. You're like, wow, dude, you just dropped like $300 just on gear for one game. And you're like, wow, that's impressive. But in KBO, when I started going there, I mean, 
everybody at the at the stadium had their gear on. But then literally, as soon as the game's over, they are packing it, rolling it in tightly in a ball and shoving it in their backpack and then jumping on the train or not, you know, taking off their hat. And I'm like, why aren't they like, why are they wearing a LA Dodgers hat more proudly than say the Deuce on Bears hat outside the stadium? And so slowly, even the last time that I lived there in 20, uh, 2014 to 2016, I actually saw more, a few more people wearing KBO gear just as like their everyday hat or something. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, like it's becoming a little more acceptable, I guess. Um, I mean, you see all these like major league baseball teams being worn on the streets over there. And I'm like, still, it still blows me away that I'm like, why isn't KBO just marketing themselves better so that rather than wearing your Dodgers hat, your, you what you know Cleveland Indians hat out on the street there they're just like hey you should be wearing the Deuce on Bears hat you should be wearing the SK Wyverns hat you should just do that I still think more they should market themselves a little bit better for that so that it's become more acceptable to do that like why is wearing a Dodgers hat cooler than wearing say a uh, Deuce on Bears jacket or something so I you know it's it's still kind of that but overall in general the biggest has been the fan interest from the uh from the fans in Korea of how it's increased. Can I just ask you as well, Danny, because one of the things I've noticed that's changed so much about Korean baseball is just the quality of the ballparks. A lot of them are, are brand new, like in Daegu and Gwangju and obviously the Gochak Sky Dome. Some of them have been redeveloped, such as the stadium in Suwon. You mentioned that you were there about 20 years ago. Um, what do you think of new ballparks? And do you think this really adds to... Um, you know, what, what we get from Korean baseball now in terms of the experience that the, 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 the league really needed to move on to these more modern and, and a lot of these are really beautiful ballparks as well. Yeah, totally. The, the, it helps with the fan experience. Just going to a nicer stadium, not run down. I know, uh, Andrew, you, you probably went to the old Kia stadium and have been to the new Kia stadium. It's probably night and day for you. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I still prefer Chamshil Stadium, not not being biased, but I'm a little bit biased, I guess. Um, <laughs> when I went when I went to the Suwon game, when I saw the Hyundai Unicorns, I was just like, man, this stadium is very generic, very bland. There's no atmosphere. There's no fans. And now when I watch, I've not been not been to a KT Wiz game, um, but when I watch them on TV. And I'm like, wow, that stadium is actually really impressive looking. They got that height pub out in center field. I assume it's still open. They have like a water slide. They even have fans. And I'm like, holy cow. Like I had, I, I, my prediction was that Su- the KT Wiz were not going to get a lot of fans to their games. And I've actually been generally su- surprised for being an expansion team that's not had a lot of luck until this season. They still have that. They still have, they have a pretty good fan base. They're very creative in the way that they market themselves. Um, I've actually been impressed by that by them so far in the last few years of how they've done down in Suwon. But yes, yeah, the new stadiums, um, that's a remodeled stadium, but the new stadiums like Tegu, NC, that NC ballpark, I want to, I, I want to go to. Um, when I lived down in that area, I lived in Jinhae for a summer in 2008. The NC Dinos were not around. I had to tra- travel an hour to go to the Lotte Giants game. And so I just want to go down there, see and experience the NC Dinos country now, and then see that brand new stadium because that everything I see, at least on videos and everything, that stadium looks like it's, you know, major league quality. That's how nice and new it looks. So like, I think it's great because it gives more fans, like the casual fan, like, Hey, I want to go out to a game. They don't want to go to like this old rundown ballpark. Now they're in like a luxury, you know, you can sit in a nice seat. You have very good food options to choose from. It feels clean. It just feels like a better environment than say 20 years ago, going to a lot of the older, you know, outdated stadiums i just have one last quick question for you very broad uh sorry to put you on the spot but in this time what has been a memory that has stuck with you that you would say has you know left a mark on you that has come from the kbo sure other than the my kbo meetup that we had about five years ago where i just again under a lot of adult beverages being drunk, I made a jump from the um, first row to the dugout and nailed my shin on it. It was filled with fluid, started to be gross for the next few weeks after that. And I still have the scar because they had to drain it. I still have the scar from when they drained it. So I still, that, that, that memory will last me for the next forever because I, it, I have the scar, but on <laughs> outside of that, that's um, Andrew would probably remember that, or maybe he doesn't because there was a lot of, be, of beverages being drunk that time. Uh, in the last 20 years, honestly, the most, 
I don't know if I have the, you know, the most unique experience, but probably is just like my first game experience because that's what got me hooked on the KBO. And again, I don't remember it as vividly as maybe some others have their first game experience. I just remember being blown away again at the cheering, the singing, the positivity again. Uh, and it's just generally all, all the games that I go to whenever I'm in Korea are just always a new experience for me. Um, and I've been to a lot of games. It's just always a fun time. One game that sticks out to me, it's not even not even a KBO game. It was actually lead up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics. I got to go out to Chamshou and see the Cuban national team take on the Korean national team. And I just remember that I think the tickets were free or I don't even know how I got in there. There's like less than a thousand people watching these two national teams play each other. And I just remember sitting like three rows behind <laughs> three rows away and just going wow this is awesome that i'm watching like two of these national you know who, they end up going you know that's the gold medal game right there but i got to watch them in you know right the month before they're going over to beijing for that and got to watch them up close um again amazed at the lack of fan support at the time but i think it was like a weekday at like two o'clock because i don't know why they would choose that time but that's what it was and just going well everybody's at work but i enjoyed it because i was sitting like three rows back and got to watch with my friends so that was one one not specific kbo memory but a korean baseball memory well danny thanks again for giving us so much of your time um you always share with us some great stories of kbo oh thank you guys for having me on it's been an honor love hanging out with you guys love talking baseball love that the podcast is back uh, love what you guys are doing because, like I said, lack of English resources has always been my number one complaint, um, and I'm just too lazy to to add any more to it, basically. So thank you guys for having the podcast. Thank you for adding uh, more voices, more perspective to the league uh, for other fans to enjoy, like myself, um, because it's been 20 years of basically not a lot of interest in the league, and then all of a sudden 2020 comes around, and then there's just fans from all over the world looking for kbo information so i'm glad that there's other sites out there other podcasts out there just more resources available for the fans so thank you guys for coming back andrew especially because you're the one that's kind of you and matthew have been around uh from the previous with grand slam so i'm glad that you guys brought it back brought the brad brought brads along with you um it's 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 truly awesome to see also i've always told people i think it's great because i think what Andrew, Matthew, Brad, yourself are all from non-traditional baseball playing countries. And so the fact that one, you're all, you all have met up in South Korea and then you all have this passion for Korean baseball, just me as the, the dumb American here that grew up watching baseball thinks this is awesome to see that like, who would have known that a guy from Ireland, England, South Africa are all going to meet in Korea, maybe like the KBO, or I know Andrews, they grew to love it because the Kia Tigers won the very first year that he showed up there. Um, it's just amazing to me, like how that bond can be, you know, whether you grew up watching baseball like myself or just came upon it by living in Korea for the last 10 years. I think it's great. And you guys are a testament to that of like how much the KBO and passion and fandom can run to, you know, people all over the world. So I think that you guys are a great example of that. At the money's in the post, Danny. Thanks very much for that. I was just going to say, I expect, I expect my check to be sent over real soon. But no, honestly, you guys, keep on doing what you're doing. I think it's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Danny Kurtz of My KBO, the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you so much. That's our show done for this week. Grand Sam KBO weekly walk-off. Another big thank you to Danny Kurtz of MyKBO.net for his time. So for me, Andrew Farrell and Brad Dene, we hope you enjoyed this show and we'll be back next week with more of the Korean Baseball League. Thank you. Take care, guys.